Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for that nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. Um, so as Anna says, I'm going to be talking about mindful eating and whether it can help us eat more healthily. So first of all, um, the term mindfulness, um, it's something that I think we kind of hear a lot about these days. It's often, um, you often hear this word sort of reported in the press in relation to all sorts of different things. So these are just a few examples of headlines from UK newspapers um, that have talked about mindfulness. So for example, here at the top, we have a headline saying, Mindfulness boosts student mental health during exams. Um, then at the bottom left, we've got mums relying on wine could benefit from mindful drinking. And then we've got, can mindfulness make you a better skier? And then my favorite here um, is mindful salad dressing. So I'm not entirely sure how this salad dressing is mindful. I've yet to get my hands on a jar of it, um, but certainly it gives the impression that somehow this salad dressing uh, is good for your mental health. But the point here really is um, that this term mindfulness is, is kind of applied to just about anything and everything these days from the really quite important to the totally trivial. And that also applies to eating behaviours. So mindful eating is increasingly being promoted to the public, I think, as a way of losing weight and eating more healthily. So, for example, if you go onto any sort of online bookstore um, and type in the words mindfulness and eating or mindfulness and weight loss, you're presented with a huge array of different books, all promising um, that mindful eating will help you lose weight, end the struggle with food, um, end overeating, satisfy your hunger, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a, a kind of small sample of some of these books here. And I don't know what it's like in Germany, but certainly in the UK, our public health services are also increasingly incorporating mindful eating into uh, therapies and interventions delivered to patients. For example, in relation to things like um, diabetes and diabetes prevention and weight loss and weight management. So given all this uh, kind of interest in mindfulness and mindful eating and all these claims, I think it's really fair to sort of question the evidence behind these claims and ask, you know, what evidence do we have uh, that mindful eating is beneficial? And what I want to do in this talk is, um, first of all, I'm going to say a little bit more about um, how sometimes we get a little bit of disparity between what the research evidence is, is telling us and what we end up seeing in the headlines or sort of presented to the public. Then I'm going to say a little bit more about what, what we actually mean when we talk about mindful eating. And then finally, I'm going to talk about three different mindful eating practices for which I think there is the most evidence uh, for effects. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll, you'll come away firstly, perhaps um, with maybe a little bit more skepticism about some of the headlines, but also perhaps with um, some mindful eating practices that you might like to try out. Okay, so first of all, um, from research to headlines, what, what kind of happens in this process? So when I was a kid, we used to play this game at parties, and I expect you've probably all played a version of this game at some point in your lives, um, where you get a big group of kids and you all sit in a circle 
um, and the first child thinks up a message and they whisper it into the ear of the child sat on their left and that child whispers the same message to the child on their left left and it all goes round the circle until it gets back to the start and what invariably you find is that the message that you started with is quite different from the message that you end up with and I think this is a really good analogy for what sometimes happens um, between the initial research and then what we see in the headlines or presented to the public. Um, something sort of gets lost in translation and we don't always get a really good representation of, of what's happened in the research. So I want to highlight um, two, I guess, key reasons perhaps why we sometimes get this um, disparity between the, the research and the reporting. So the first of these relates to um, correlation versus causation. And again, I'm sure this is a phrase that you've all heard of, which is that correlation is not causation. So what I want you to do is imagine um, that we have um, a researcher who's maybe recruited a really big sample of participants and uh, she sends them out lots of different questionnaires. And what she finds is that people who report being more mindful in daily life also report eating um, a healthier diet. So she might quite rightly conclude that people who are more mindful are more likely to eat healthily. And that's quite accurate, except that it can then get misinterpreted as the mindfulness being the cause of the healthy eating. So because people are more mindful, then they eat a healthier diet. And of course, we can't actually draw that conclusion from this data because it's a cross-sectional, correlational uh, study. It could just as easily be the case that people who eat more healthily, that leads them to be more mindful. So for example, we know um, that eating a healthy diet is good for your mental health. So it could be that the direction of, of causality runs in the opposite direction. Equally, we might get an association here because of a third underlying variable. And in this case, it could be something like socioeconomic status. So um, a person's level of education and their income, for example. So we know that people who have a higher socioeconomic status tend to report being more mindful and they also tend to report eating a healthier diet. So it's quite possibly the case that um, this link, this correlation between mindfulness and healthy eating that we see only comes about because they're both linked to socioeconomic status, which is a variable um, that tends not to be measured in these types of studies. So here we have um, a, a study that's showing that these two variables are related, but what sometimes happens is that it then gets reported as mindfulness increases healthy eating or increases emotional intelligence um, or sleep or whatever else it is that the, that the study has measured. So that's one way I think in which things can sometimes get lost in translation um, from the evidence to the sort of the, the public uh, delivery of the results. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, OK, what we really need is um, a good experimental study where we recruit people and we randomize them into an experimental group. And then we give them some kind of intervention to make them more mindful. And we have a control group where we don't give them any intervention to make them more mindful. And then we measure our outcome of interest, such as healthy eating or diet 
or weight loss or whatever. And you'd be absolutely right that this would um, give us uh, much better evidence of causality. And this is what a lot of research studies do, but there's another problem associated with some of this type of research, which is that these types of studies don't always just include mindfulness when they deliver that intervention to the experimental group. What they sometimes do, or they often do, is include a lot of additional non-mindfulness elements. So they might develop up a mindfulness-based intervention um, to increase, for example, mindful eating, but alongside they might, for example, deliver that intervention in a group setting. So people are getting social support from other people, which we know is quite important for bringing about behavior change. Um, they might have some educational components in there, they might also include other elements designed to increase people's motivation for behavior change. So in itself, this is, this is kind of a, a really good idea because we know that behavior change is really, really hard. So you kind of want to throw everything that you have at the problem and include lots of different elements. And we know that these type of multi-component interventions tend to be more effective at bringing about change than interventions that just use one particular element. But the problem is, is that it then makes it quite difficult when it comes to interpretation. So we might find that our mindfulness-based intervention that's included all these different elements um, is effective at helping people lose weight or helping them eat more healthily. But we won't necessarily know which of those elements have been key at driving those effects. We won't know whether it's um, the mindfulness components or whether perhaps it's all just down to the kind of the education and the social support um, and the kind of the motivational strategies. So I've said here kind of mindfulness is not always just mindful mindfulness. Um, so although we might hear that a particular mindfulness based intervention is effective, um, that might be the case, but it may not be the mindfulness-based elements of that intervention that are driving those effects. So the key takeaway here really is that when reading about the kind of the latest mindfulness-based um, research results is maybe just, um, if you can, question the type of research that it's based on. Um, is it based on an experimental study? And if so, um, what was involved in that kind of manipulation, that intervention? Was it just mindfulness or were there perhaps other elements um, that could be driving those effects? Okay, so at this point, you might be thinking, okay, well, what is mindful eating? And to explain that, I'm going to start by saying a little bit about uh, mindfulness. So there are lots of different definitions of mindfulness. They do vary. Um, this one here is from John Kabat-Zinn who says that mindfulness is awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Now that's a little bit of a mouthful, so we're going to try and break it down a bit. So first of all, we have this idea of paying attention on purpose to the present moment. So present moment awareness. So this is the idea that you're paying attention to what's going on in that immediate moment, whether that's your immediate surroundings um, or it could be your internal bodily sensations, your emotions um, or your thoughts. 
And then we have this other idea of non-judgment or acceptance. So this is the idea um, that not only you're attending to these things, um, but you're attending to them with an attitude of non-judgment or acceptance. So you're not trying to um, control them or, or get rid of them. You're not judging them as, as good or bad. Um, you're simply noticing them and attending to them. Now, some practitioners would argue that if you just repeatedly engage in this type of present moment awareness practice, then this kind of attitude of acceptance and non-judgment will emerge naturally from this practice. But others would argue that you need to um, encourage or promote that more directly as well. And then we also have um, this other sort of key characteristic of mindfulness, which is this idea of decentering. So this is the idea um, that you create a little bit of space between yourself and your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings. So you see them as something slightly separate to yourself um, that are transient rather than things that are sort of permanent and fixed. And again, some would argue that if you repeatedly practice present moment awareness and acceptance, um, this decentering emerges naturally. But on the other hand, there are also mindfulness based interventions that will directly target um, this practice of decentering separately from the other elements. So that's a little introduction to mindfulness. Um, in terms of mindful eating, so again, there's, there's a, a wide range of different definitions of, of mindful eating. I would argue that really mindful eating is simply the application of mindfulness to eating related thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. But if we take this definition, then we can see that this actually leads to a very wide variety of different practices. So if we take this notion of present moment awareness, so attending to what's happening in your present moment, firstly, you could apply that to the food that you're eating. So you could pay attention um, to the taste and the texture and the color of the food. But also you could pay attention to your internal bodily sensations. So for example, whether you're feeling hungry, whether you're feeling full. So that's still present moment awareness. You're still paying attention to what's going on um, in your present moment, but actually they're two quite different strategies. Alternatively, you could pay attention to the cues in your environment um, or even the cues internally that prompt you to eat or that make you feel like eating. So again, you're paying attention to something uh, quite different from your internal bodily sensations or the food that you're eating. In terms of acceptance, then again, we might try to think about promoting acceptance of food cravings or urges to eat. Or we might think about directing acceptance at our food related thoughts. So the things that kind of run through our head in relation to food, the things that we tell ourselves um, about food. And again, we could do the same with decentering. So we could try to decenter from food related thoughts. So sort of verbalizations. We could also attempt to um, create some distance from to decenter from um, our kind of urges in relation to, to food. So you can see, I hope, how um, this means really the term mindful eating, it, it doesn't really just relate to one thing. There's all sorts of different strategies um, 
that somebody could be engaging in that we could term mindful eating. Now, it might be the case that if you were very, very skilled at mindfulness um, and perhaps you spent an awful lot of time um, practicing mindfulness, you might sort of regularly be applying all these different strategies to all these different situations and they might have quite consistent effects on your behavior. However, I think we need to be quite um, realistic about this really when we're thinking about mindfulness and mindful eating as a sort of health intervention because most of us just simply do not have the kind of the time or, or the mental energy um, or the motivation to engage in extended mindfulness meditations or mindfulness practices. So to be realistic about this really, I think most people um, would perhaps maybe just pick one or two of these strategies to implement, um, which means that they might be having uh, slightly different effects from how they might occur if you were a very skilled practitioner who was applying this across you know all of your all of your sort of daily life so what we talk about when we talk about uh mindful eating um in terms of of, of sort of the general public and most people um is it, it could refer to a range of different strategies that people might be applying and that might have different effects for different types of people. For example, attending to your internal bodily cues, feelings of hunger um, and fullness might have quite different effects depending on whether you've just eaten or whether you're hungry, whether you're somebody who's trying to lose weight, et cetera. So the takeaway here really, um, takeaway message is that the term mindful eating is used to refer to a range of different practices that could have quite different effects on behavior and also might be work differently for different people. Okay, so in the last part of my talk, what I wanted to do is to give you um, three practices that I've really just picked out um, because I think they're the ones that currently we have the best evidence for in terms of effects on eating behaviors. And by evidence, in this case, I really mean experimental evidence that has looked at that practice in isolation rather than as part of a, a sort of big multi-component intervention. So my first kind of uh, top tip here um, is to try to limit distractions when you're eating. Now, I think arguably you might say this is, isn't really mindful eating because it's just about sort of taking away distractions. But I've included it here um, partly because it is something for which there is pretty good evidence for in terms of its influence on eating behaviours. Um, and also because it is it's definitely advice that tends to get paired up with mindful eating when so when people are talking about mindful eating um this is the advice that that often is included um included there okay so limit distractions so really this means um when you're eating um, a meal or, or a snack is to turn off your your kind of tv um close your computer stop scrolling etc cetera, etc cetera, anything that might kind of distract you uh from the food and what this, uh, what this, the research suggests this does is that it, it reduces the amount that you eat. Um, so it reduces the tendency to overeat. And this uh, seems to occur for a couple of reasons. So when we eat, then we uh, tend to experience food habituation. So we kind of just get a bit tired of eating. Um, it's not quite as pleasurable towards the end of a meal as it was at the start of the meal. 
Um, and we also experience something called sensory specific satiation. So this refers to the feelings of fullness that we experience um, that are specific to certain tastes. So for example, you've all probably had the experience where you have a great big first course savory meal and you feel absolutely stuffed, but somehow you've still got room for a sweet pudding afterwards. And that's because of sensory specific satiation. So these two factors um, work to just kind of stop us eating food habituation and sensory specific satiation. But what happens when we eat when we're distracted is that it interferes with these processes. Um, and so we're less likely to, to stop eating. We stop eating later than we would have done otherwise. And then the other thing that's quite interesting about this area is not only if you eat with distractions, not only do you eat more at that point, but you also are more likely to eat more later on in the day. And the reason for this is because distractions impair our memory for the food that we've eaten. And we know that memory has a really important influence on our food intake. So for example, people who suffer from amnesia might eat multiple meals because they can't remember previous eating episodes. So we know that our, our kind of memory helps us interpret our physiological cues. So for example, if, you're, if you notice your stomach kind of rumbling a little bit, depending on, on what you've eaten, you might interpret that as hunger if you think you haven't eaten for a while, or you might interpret it as something else, you know, feeling a bit nervous or something like that. Um, so memory will influence our food intake. Now, if we remember that we ate a really big meal at lunch, um, then that will feed into our choices and our decision making um, about what we subsequently eat. But if we've eaten whilst distracted, then it will impair that memory for food. Um, which means we're more likely to subsequently eat more. So when should we apply this strategy? So I've put here, here that really we should just apply it when it's, it's practical and desirable because I kind of think with this strategy, although there's, there's lots of great evidence showing how it's, it really kind of reduces overeating, et cetera, et cetera, um, I worry that it might just kind of completely take the joy out of eating um, a lot of times. Um, you know, I think it, it's, you know, we all like eating um, uh, socially with other people, you know, having good conversation. Um, you know, it, it's nice to eat good food in front of a movie or, you know, when you go to the cinema. And I think to to try to, only eat your meals with no distraction um, would take the joy out of life a little bit. Um, so I think probably it's not very realistic um, to expect people to apply this strategy all the time. Likewise, I know that kind of during the week, um, I always eat my lunch, you know, in front of my laptop working, because I kind of think, well, if I stop working for half an hour to eat, then that's effectively you know, half an hour less time I get to spend with my family at the end of the day. So I think there are very good practical um, reasons why this might not always be um, the best strategy, but perhaps it's something to try on occasions um, where it's, it's easy to do and you're not sort of, it's not to the detriment of anything else in your life. Okay, so that leads me on to my second strategy, which is to focus on your food. Um, so when you're eating, notice the taste, the texture, the temperature, um, and the flavors of the food in your mouth. And this potentially is something that you could do um, periodically, um, even if you are eating whilst uh, uh, distracted in front of the TV, etc. So there's evidence to suggest um, that when we do this, then this can sometimes reduce 
um, our subsequent consumption of, for example, high calorie snacks. Um, we don't know exactly um, why this happens, but it is potentially because it slows down the rate of eating. And what this does is it increases something called orosensory exposure. So this is the amount of time that food spends in your mouth. And we know that orosensory exposure um, promotes the release of gut hormones that signal fullness, which then will mean that we're less inclined to, to, to kind of eat more, um, to overeat. So the implications of this really um, are that this strategy might be particularly useful for people who are fast eaters. So we know that there is a hereditary component to eating speed. So for example, some people are just naturally very fast eaters and some people are naturally very slow eaters. And we know that people who are fast eaters are more likely to have a higher BMI um, or to be a kind of overweight or obese. So potentially this strategy uh, could be useful for those who are, who are naturally fast eaters um, to help kind of slow down that rate of eating. Similarly, this strategy um, may be more or less effective depending on the situation. So, so in certain situations, we tend to eat um, more or less quickly. So we might eat more quickly um, when we're very hungry um, or when we're in a hurry. So again, applying this strategy in those types of situations um, might be when it's more likely to, to have an effect or to be useful because it would be slowing down your rate of eating. So my last um, tip is to notice unhelpful thoughts. So this is really about noticing um, any unhelpful thoughts, things that you that you say to yourself about food. So the things that um, perhaps go through your head, the sort of internal verbalizations. Um, so you might say to yourself, after you've had a really difficult day at work, you might say, I, you know, I really need a glass of wine. Um, or you're feeling fed up and you might um, have a tendency to say to yourself, oh, some chocolate would really cheer me up. And it might be that these types of thoughts um, tend to kind of automatically prompt the associated behavior without you really giving too much thought to it. And that's absolutely fine if that's kind of, um, you know, something that you want to do and something that, that brings you pleasure, etc. But in some cases, it might be that these behaviors are not really um, what we want to engage in. They're perhaps not, don't really align um, with um, our, our sort of goals. So here, the strategy would be to, first of all, to kind of notice the, the sort of things that you say to yourself um, and then to try and create a little bit of distance between yourself and these thoughts. And there are various ways of doing this, various kind of strategies to help create some distance. So one of the strategies that we've used um, in some of our research is we get people to imagine that they are the driver of a bus and they're driving towards their, their goal, whatever their goal is, and their thoughts are a little bit like noisy passengers on that bus. And their thoughts can be as disruptive as they like uh, and say whatever they like, but they, as the driver of the bus, are still in control of where they're going um, and they can still drive the bus to wherever they want to go. So this is just a strategy really um, for creating a little bit of space between yourself and your thoughts and seeing those thoughts as more kind of transient things that 
are not ne don't necessarily reflect reality. And this may be helpful because it, it interrupts habit. So it may be that we that we sort of get into the habit of responding to um, particular thoughts in our head with particular behaviors and we do them automatically without really thinking too much about them and just um, kind of noticing these thoughts and, and interrupting these habits may give you just enough space um, to kind of remember I guess your, your goals and maybe think of alternative courses of action. So like all the other strategies that I, I've talked about here, um, this is not something that's going to work for everybody. So some people might find it more effective. Some people might find it uh, less helpful. Um, in particular, um, people differ in the extent to which they engage in internal verbalization. So I think some people tend to have a kind of continuous monologue going along in their head, whereas other people sort of don't hear anything in their heads at, at all in relation to sort of verbalization so so obviously if you're if you're not someone who says things to yourself in your head then the strategy isn't going to work for you um, but what research does suggest is that this strategy might be particularly helpful um, for people who experience um, eating behaviors that are perhaps a little bit more problematic so um, perhaps things like uh, binge into binge eating. Okay, so um, that's kind of all my strategy. So just to conclude, um, first of all, don't believe everything that you hear about mindful eating. Um, so maybe just be a little bit um, skeptical, I guess. Um, but if you are interested in trying out mindful eating, uh, then these would be the, the strategies that I would suggest currently uh, have the best evidence behind them. So firstly, to limit distractions while you're eating, if that's practical and desirable. Um, secondly, to focus on the taste and the texture of your food as you eat. And thirdly, um, to just notice whether you have any unhelpful thoughts around food and to try and create a little bit of space between yourself and those thoughts. And if you are interested in this topic and you want to do a little bit of further reading, then I've put a reference down here um, for a review paper that you might like to look at. And I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. Great, great talk. Thank you so much, Katie, for this. Very interesting. And so uh, please be, feel free to put in some questions in the chat if you have any. I, we already have one. So uh, someone wants to know if um, is a conversation with other people also considered a distraction from eating? Yeah, so uh, that's a really, really good question. So, so there's lots of interesting research in relation to eating socially. And I think to, to a certain extent it is, but it's not quite as distracting as for example, watching something on TV or um, you know, scrolling on your on your sort of your phone or your screen or whatever. Um, because there's much more kind of space uh, within that interaction. But the influence of eating with others on eating behavior is is quite mixed. So so in some circumstances, it can um, increase the amount people eat. Um, but in other cases, um, it can actually decrease the amount people eat, you know, perhaps because they're they're trying to create a good impression. If you're eating with strangers who are not eating so much or somebody you don't know so well who isn't eating so much. Um, then you might try and sort of match their behavior. Um, but you're, if you're eating with friends who are, you know, keep having second helpings, et cetera, then you, then you might also eat more as well. So, so I guess the influence of others on eating um, uh, varies depending on the context. And in, in terms of distraction, um, 
I think it, it, it probably does represent a distraction, but not quite as much as, as some of the other behaviors that we've, that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It shows again how complicated really it is to, to support the different uh, influences, really. Yeah, I was actually wondering, um, so since, you know, we in, in the course uh, that we teach here, um, we just reviewed all the um, behavioral change techniques that are out there, different models and so on. And so for me, it seems like, um, you know, mindfulness isn't really anything that that you could sort of put into any of these um, yeah, models, really. It just stands for itself. Would you agree or do you think you could? Yeah, no, I think that's this? really interesting because, yeah. in fact, when you look at um, the sort of the kind of behavior change techniques that people talk about, often the mindfulness doesn't really uh, slot in very well. Um, I mean, I think it does relate to, to things like, um, I guess, to more automatic processes and habits, because a lot of mindfulness, I guess, is about paying attention um, to our behaviours, perhaps becoming aware of things that maybe we're not always very aware of. Um, so in that way, I think it relates more to the automatic processes rather than those more kind of reflective processes I guess but it perhaps creates a bit of space for for reflective processes yeah it's interesting that you mentioned the habits because that that would have been my next question because you don't really and you know with the mindfulness you don't intend to create a new habit I guess but it might be the consequence of it right yeah so you might become aware I guess of, of where something is at where as a habit that you're repeatedly doing and it's only once you're you're kind of aware of that that then you can you can change it and you can identify okay that's the cue that tends to elicit that behavior you might think well how can I change that cue or 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 maybe you just um pay more attention to trying to um, not behave in that particular way as a result of that cue. I mean, there is potentially, I guess, some overlaps as well with some of the some of the sort of self-monitoring literature and self-control literature, um, where you again you're sort of paying attention to, to what you're doing, you're looking for patterns um, across your, your behavior. Um, and then that kind of, I guess, leads you to have insights about you know what's causing your behavior and how you then might might change things to to help you change your behavior okay any other questions in the chat maybe i'm just gonna look at whether i have any more no then I think um, I just want to thank you very much again, Katie, for this very wonderful talk. And uh, I'm sure the students also appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. And um, maybe see you again. <laughs> very much. It was lovely to talk to you. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.